Well, welcome everyone to our final week of virtual grow group talking about the book of Philippians, finishing up our series, working through this wonderful letter from Paul, teaching us about how to have confidence and hope even in the midst of uncertain circumstances and uncertain circumstances sounds a lot like the world that we live in today and the country that we live in today i i think i've i've been really burdened during these last uh, several days these last couple of weeks just about how much pain and anxiety and difficulty are in our country today and and so we need god's word and the promises of his word and, and more than that we need to encounter the god of god's word and and my prayer is that as we continue in talking about these last verses in philippians chapter 4 today that we will do exactly that, that we will hear a word from god himself that would bring us encouragement and hope and so without further ado let's just jump in and see what god would say to us kyle i'll let you lead us through this through this discussion as we get started today. Yeah, absolutely. Well, everybody, thanks again for joining us. Um, as I was kind of driving to the office this morning, I was reflecting on this journey that we've been on. And I think journey is probably one of the most appropriate words, given the fact that, you know, a journey, there are easy parts of a journey, there are uh, medium difficulty parts of a journey, and then they're just flat out hard parts of the journey. And, you know, like you said, I too have been burdened um, this this weekend, um, just thinking about the pain, the brokenness, the the lack of hope that so many people feel. And uh, I love uh, how our conversations have, uh, over the last several weeks and months have just been centered on that idea of God's hope and how you know. I don't want to spoil any of your thunder, so I won't. But you will be leading our adult ministry uh, through even more of a focus on hope uh, yeah. as I attempt to lead our students through a focus on hope um, in the coming days. So without further ado, let's finish this book uh, strong. So yes. we are in chapter four. We're going to talk through verses 10 through 23. And so Paul's kind of, you know, uh, not kind of, he is putting the finishing touches on this letter and uh, kind of sewing up some last minute details, if you will. And, uh, but it's still really important, still very encouraging and still there's a lot of truth that we can gather from it. So that's right. Yeah. Uh, starting in verse 10, let me read it. It says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need for I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound in any in every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. And then, Scott, we get to what is arguably one of the most, in my humble opinion, uh, misinterpreted verses in Scripture. Yeah. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And we'll come back to that for sure. Yeah. Uh, verse 14, yet it was kind of you to share my trouble and you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God, I love these words will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Paul, out. Yeah. So, so um you know, my Bible really has these verses, this last chunk of Philippians, kind of separated uh, into two parts. Um, part number one, and, and this may not be the most natural, you know, um, grouping of them, but this is just the way that my Bible did it. Yeah. Um, verses 10 through 20, um, the, the subheading or the heading is God's provision. So let's talk about 
let's talk about these verses. Um, we'll probably spend the majority of our time here because the final three verses are kind of just shout outs, if you will. Yeah, yeah, they're important, but I think the focus for us today is, is probably good to spend most of our time up at the top. Yeah, so um, talk to us a little bit. Obviously, everybody knows verse 13, right? <laughs> um, and I know you've taught this before. I've taught this before. Um, it is insanely important when studying the Bible to know and understand what comes before a verse and what comes after a verse. So everybody's quick to talk about Philippians 4, 4.13, and we put it on t-shirts, and we tweet it, and it's our status and stuff. But what about verses 10, 11, and 12? What are some things from your perspective that you see that really help set up Paul's words in verse 13? Yeah, so let's, let's start maybe with the historical context, because he is talking about a very specific scenario here that he's... Sure. He's already referenced and hinted at throughout the rest of the letter, but he here he really gives a very personal word to this church. And, and what that personal word is, is that they had sent a gift to Paul. You know, prisons in the ancient world were very different than prisons today in that the jailer didn't provide food or nourishment to the prisoners. They were on their own to provide for whatever they needed. And so Paul, while he is in prison, needs someone who can provide for his well-being. He needs friends uh, who can help to take care of him. And so the Philippian church has stepped into that gap. They, are, they have sent a, a generous gift. And we, and we know from what Paul describes this church in, in 2 Corinthians when he's talking about another big offering that that Paul helped to organize for the church in Jerusalem who was undergoing a famine. Uh, he tells the Corinthian church, which was relatively well off, he says, man, the, the churches in Macedonia, which the Philippian church would be one of those, he said, you know, they have given unbelievably generously, and that's despite their own poverty. <laughs> you know, so this is a church that is not affluent by any stretch. You know, to talk about disposable income is to talk about you know, nothing for them. They don't have, everything they give will cost them something that they need probably. Mm -hmm. But yet they have given time and time and time again to support Paul in his, in his mission. You know, when he went to Thessalonica after leaving Philippi, they kept sending him money to help support him during his ministry in Thessalonica. They yeah. support this anti-poverty offering that Paul takes up to help care for the saints in Jerusalem. They're now, again, supporting Paul just in his basic daily necessities so that he can survive while he is in prison. And so that's, that's the historical context. And so what Paul is doing here is he's now reflecting theologically on what they have given. Now, that's important for a few reasons in the original context, because gift giving in the ancient world was, was culturally complex. And every gift that was given created a whole you know, cascade of different social obligations in return. And so some of what Paul is doing here is subverting that system of, of giving so that you will be given to. But he's also, I think, just trying to redirect it entirely <laughs> mm -hmm. and say, this is not... Um, we need to remember that when we're actually giving to one another within the body of Christ, there's bigger things than just our own relationship. We, we are part of a kingdom, and, and everything that we are giving to one another, we're in fact giving as an offering to God. And so first, Paul deals with kind of his own experience in this first paragraph, 10 through 13, kind of his own experience of receiving the gift and, and how that changes his own situation, um, which... Paul basically says, it doesn't change my situation. I'm fine either way. We, we should talk more about that. But then in the next paragraph, uh, 14 through 20 or 14 through 19, depending on how your Bible breaks it up, he's saying, here's, here's actually what this gift means for you as you've given it. Here's what you are actually doing. Whatever you thought you were doing in your gift, I want to tell you what you were actually doing when you yeah. gave this gift to me and in support of the ministry that I'm doing, even while I'm in chains in prison. 
And so that's kind of what's just in terms of the background of what's happening here in these in these paragraphs. Sure, that's really really good. Um, so you know, ultimately, like you said, um, Paul is trying to redirect, and I think we've talked about that at length um, throughout our study of Philippians. Yeah, he does a lot of that, trying to take the focus off of one thing and redirect it and put it back on where it needs to be. And you know, verse eleven. I think once again, um, you alluded to this, but I think this is these are some powerful words, especially in the days in which we live currently. Um, you know, he says, not that I'm speaking of being in need, which do you, when you read those words, I mean, obviously you, you know, the cultural context, you just shared that with us, but isn't it interesting that a man in prison, um, in chains, who is relying upon other people to make sure that he does not starve to death is saying, Hey, I'm not speaking about being in need, AKA, I don't consider myself to be in, I mean, that is an incredible perspective, right? Yeah. yeah. And it sets up everything that he says in the next two verses. I know how to be brought low. There's the, this, this compare and contrast type thing. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. So I know, I know when life is tough, I know when things are good. And then he says, in any and every circumstance, and that's all encompassing, right? That's right. Yes. Yeah. It's all encompassing. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. So Paul then alludes to the secret, right? And secrets are a big deal for people like, oh, it's a secret. What? But it's not really a secret because he tells them the secret in the next verse. So I've said a lot, maybe kind of respond some of the things that, that you're thinking right now. Yeah, I mean, I, and I think that that is because, you know, he talks about the secret there in verse 12, which you, you pointed out. And he also talks in verse 11 about I've learned something. So there mm-hmm. is, there's, as, as he's so often in this, in this book, he's talked about your frame of mind, let this frame of mind, let this way of thinking, let this attitude, um, you know, and even last week, as we talked about anxiety and how much that is a part of our thinking, uh, when verse eight, you know, think about these kinds of things. You know, so Paul has a, our, our framework, the way that we see the world is so important in our life of discipleship. Yep. And so Paul's saying, you know, I've, I've learned. So he says, you know, I'm not in need. Uh, and I think that's, probably as much as anything for Paul, it's not a, a practical assessment so much as it is. He's, he's basically trying to say to them, Hey, I'm not hinting that I'm, I'm waiting for your next gift. I think he's yeah. trying to, you know, he's, he's doing his best not to put any sort of obligation on them right, there. Sure. sure. Uh, because yeah, clearly, I mean, he has practically speaking, he has needs without yes. a doubt. Indeed. But what he's saying is even in those needs, I've learned to be content. Um, I've learned that my, my circumstances are sufficient. And and what I want to point out about this is that Paul then says something that's very, very radical. And I think the radical part is not, that Paul feels like he's okay, even if he's in a really desperate, impoverished situation. Mm -hmm. I think the radical thing that Paul says is, I've had to learn how to be okay, even in a situation of, first he calls it plenty, and then he calls it abundance. Most of us don't feel like while I am facing a situation of abundance, and that is a real problem for me, I sense that there's a real danger here, and I need some kind of secret. I need to learn how to deal with these riches that I've just all of a sudden come into. You know, this is, man, somebody fill me in on what I need to do here. That is not our general, mm-hmm. that is not our general response. And what Paul is, what Paul is helping us realize here, and here's, here's the secret element, I think, is that whatever kind of life circumstances that we are facing, whether those would be circumstances of, of real, genuine poverty and need, 
or if they are situations of affluence and ease and comfort and convenience, both of those face a kind of danger for us. And that danger is that we can forget that we belong to the Lord Mm -hmm. and that all of our circumstances are under his good, faithful, kind, generous, sovereign control. Um, That there's nothing that's coming into our lives that isn't out of his fatherly love and care for us. And so we have to learn how do we, how do we deal with that? (laughs) How do we interact with that? And so what Paul, Paul learns is that all of these circumstances, whether I'm going to have to deal with the unique temptations of affluence, and, and Paul writes more about these in 1 Timothy 6, if you're interested in looking at that, kind of look at the end of 1 Timothy 6, if you want to think more about some of those temptations that we face in times of, of wealth or a relative ease, or the dangers of thinking that God has, you know, abandoned us, that he has left us without, that we don't have enough. You know, that's another set of dangers. And, and right. perhaps those are more obvious to us, the kinds of temptations to doubt and unbelief that would come in those circumstances. But Paul says either way, the secret is that I'm going to be able to live a life of faithfulness, whatever situation the Father's put me in, because I can do it through Jesus Christ who gives me strength to whatever, to whatever challenges I face in that particular day. And that gives us real hope. You know, again, as you were mentioning earlier about context, you know, oftentimes this is, um, you know, <laughs> we, we rip this out of, and, and so we, we think about this as being a verse that basically promises unlimited personal achievement. That you know what this is the this is the ultimate Nintendo cheat code for life, and you know whatever we want to do, automatic next level, automatic win, um, and that's not at all what Paul is talking about. You know, in fact, what Paul is talking about is I can do all things through Christ, even when everything that I hope to achieve does not, in fact, work out. When, it, when I couldn't do these things that I wanted to, what I can then do through Christ who strengthens me is deal with whatever ramifications come of that, whether positive or negative. Uh, if I'm victorious, Christ is going to help me learn how to be humble and faithful even in that moment. And if I lose and if I am defeated, Christ is going to help me to be faithful in that moment too and to look to his goodness and to trust his plan that he is advancing the purposes of his kingdom, no matter what's happening in my life at any given moment. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I'm really thankful that you brought out, you know, the fact that it's easy for us to think about, you know, to fall into one of those two ditches. It's, it's, you know, ditch number one of, of God has abandoned me or yes. ditch number two. I don't really need to think of him because I have everything that I need at my disposal and both of them are dangerous, right? Like you said. Yeah. So, right. you know, the, the secret then to, to life circumstances, to having the right perspective that redirecting is, Hey, Jesus, you are my strength. You, that's not saying that, you know, um, if I believe I can do all things through him, if, if I went to Minute Maid right now, put on an Astros uniform and Justin Verlander on the mound and throw me his best fastball. Um, just because I quote this verse, 99.99999% positive. Your boy's not hitting it out into the Crawford boxes. Okay. Um, probably not. No, I mean, you, there's no probably Scott, like <laughs> my time in baseball ended in, I think middle school. And so there's a reason I play baseball on PlayStation and not in real life because I was not good at it. So we can say all we want. Oh, I can do everything. I can do anything. I can do all things through Christ. But that's not like you said, that's not the heart, the perspective of this. Um, With Jesus, yes, with his strength, with his power, with the spirit, we can do unbelievably things in his power, not in our own. But that's not quite what, you know, necessarily Paul is talking about. So then he kind of switches gears a little bit to a certain extent, not totally. Um, 
and yeah. says in verse 14, yet it was kind of you to share or, you know, my Bible has a footnote, have fellowship in my trouble. Yes. So he's saying, hey, I appreciate the fact, I want to acknowledge the fact that y'all y'all stood beside me. You walked hand in hand with me. You have a part to play in the mission of God. And so, you know, maybe talk a little bit to, to everybody watching just about this idea of when we support those who are serving God's kingdom, whether they are pastors, staff members, whether they are missionaries, whether they are lay leaders who are just have a, a call on their life, God's placed a burden on their heart to do something. Talk a little bit um, just about how when we support them, we're supporting him. Just some quick right off the right off the cuff thoughts. Yeah, I uh, I'm I'm glad you brought that up because this is such an important thing. And just, you know, we we both, um, you know, in the words of the New Testament, you know, make make our living by the work of the gospel, as Paul describes it in in First Corinthians nine, and that's a good thing. And in fact, Paul says, you know, that's that's how it ought to be. And so we we certainly are grateful for the generosity of God's people. And you know, and I experienced that even before I was at Bear Creek, as as Abby and I lived overseas, and it, we raised support for the work that we did, and you know, saw people give generously even above and beyond the tithes that they would give to their local churches to give to support us in that work. And it is, it's an amazing thing. And so Paul is here, you know, saying he's, it's, I think Paul kind of realized I got a little carried away there. <laughs> you know, this is, this is becoming the world's weirdest thank you note. It's like, yeah, I didn't really need that gift. You know, I was all good. God's got, like, oh, oh yeah. And I am thankful. You know, I, just, I should probably tell so don't get the wrong idea here. You. Oops, you know, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, Paul, Paul is actually thankful. And so he's kind of retracing, kind of taking back some of his words here, maybe a little bit, uh, just to in, encourage them and say, but, but he does, he sees this in terms of fellowship and sharing and partnership. And, and so I think there's a couple of things that we could, we could say about that that are, that are hopefully really simple points, is that, you know, this is a partnership of, of giving and receiving, you know, that it, there's a mutual benefit here, both to mm -hmm. the one who gives and to the one who receives. Sure. Uh, so that's the first thing to say that, that there's, there's benefit to the giver, not only the one who receives, mm -hmm. but the second thing to say there in terms of the partnership is that it, it's, it's a partnership. It's a way okay. of being in the work together, even when you're not together. Right. And so Paul is, is saying you are vital to this work of the advancement of the gospel when you are giving. And he said, you know, this is not only true then in when I was in Thessalonica and I was kind of free and in the marketplace and preaching and in the synagogues preaching. It's not just true then. You know, it's true now, too, as, as he talked so much in chapter one. Now he he's continuing to preach, and all the Praetorian Guard is hearing about the mm -hmm. fact that he is in chains because of Christ Jesus. They're hearing the gospel, and and he's able to continue to do that because they're supporting him. You know, I think that's the astonishing thing here. And, you know, in talking about this gift, it's not you know, thank you so much for this gift that you've given in this partnership of just keeping me alive, <laughs> which you know, fair enough. But Paul is actually saying, you know, thank you for giving so that I can keep preaching the gospel. Mm -hmm. But Paul says, I need food so that I can stay alive so I can keep the gospel, not so that I can just stay alive in the sentence. Right. He wants the sustenance. He wants what he will be able to buy and, and avail himself of because of this gift so that he can continue to have the strength to preach the gospel faithfully for as many days as God would give him. And so this is a partnership. By their giving generously, it's like they are preaching right alongside Paul. Paul mm -hmm. sees them as being actively engaged in the work of the gospel when they give generously to the work of the gospel. And so that's something for us today. I mean, this is not just true for churches in, in Macedonia in the first century. This is true for us today. When we give generously to the work of the church, 
to ministries and missionaries who are spreading the work of the gospel, that's a way that we ourselves can participate in fulfilling the commission that we receive from the Lord Jesus. And it's so important for us. Um, and Paul really underscores that here. But I think another thing for us to say there is, as we see um, there in verse 18, well, let's even go back uh, to verse 17. You know, again, Paul is saying, I'm not, I'm not here just seeking the gift, meaning I'm not just seeking what's to my benefit here. I'm actually seeking the fruit, meaning the fruit of the preaching of the gospel, which again is a word that, that Paul used a, a couple of times in chapter one. Um, you know, there's fruit that comes from this preaching of the gospel, this, this labor in the gospel. And I want you to be able to have some claim on that fruit. You know, so as there is reward in heaven for our faithfulness, I want you to have a share of this. It's yeah. not all mine. It's partly yours too. And so I'm not just talking about, hey, I'm seeking the gift, meaning the benefit that comes to me. What I'm actually seeking is the fruit that the Holy Spirit would give to the preaching of the gospel that then would become for all of us just a, a share that we would have in the glory that is to come, the credit that, sure. that you would gain from that. So by giving, you actually increase is what Paul's saying here. And, and that's, that's what he wants for them. And the reason there is because in verse, those ending phrases there in verse 18, the gifts that you sent, here's how he describes them. They're a fragrant offering. They are a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And, and those phrases, especially fragrant offering, those are phrases that Paul pulls directly out of the Greek translation of the Old Testament. He, he's citing the Old Testament here, saying, okay, what you're giving when you're giving to me, mm -hmm. you're not really giving to me. You're giving to God here. Yep. And, and so your generosity here isn't even, shouldn't even be based on me or on my need, but it should be an overflow of your thanks and gratitude to God. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and now we don't make animal sacrifices because Jesus has completed the need for that. That's right. But yet we still want to be able to give offerings of gratitude to God for the salvation that we have received. In fact, the very first time that this phrase is used is, is at the end of Genesis chapter 8, when Noah, coming off the ark after being delivered, from this great act of God's wrath and judgment on the world. But Noah is delivered by his faith to believe and follow in obedience. And he gets off the ark with his family and he immediately makes an offering. And it says that it goes up like a fragrant, like a, a, a sweet smelling aroma that pleased the Lord. And Paul's drawing on that language and the language that's repeated over and over in, in Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers, describing the sacrifices that Israel was to make. Paul's basically saying this kind of generosity to the work of the gospel is the way that we continue to express gratitude to God for the salvation that we've received in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And so when we're giving to the church, when we're giving to ministers and ministries and missionaries, we're not really ultimately giving to them. We're giving to God himself. And right. it, is, it is just a small token of our appreciation and gratitude for the life that we have in Christ. Yeah. And, you know, I love how he kind of transitions and goes from, hey, I'm talking about the gifts that you're giving and what that's doing and the results of that to verse 19. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. So there's this, there's this beautiful idea of, hey, whether we're in abundance, whether we're in need, God will provide. Um, that that has been his name, you know, one of his attributes, one of his characteristics, provider from the beginning of time. And, and I just, I, I love how it says, you know, it, it, this is an un, a limitless supply, right? This isn't like a, oh yeah. man, I only have a certain amount to be able to bestow on people. And then once that is, is bled dry, then 
tough luck for anybody who comes afterwards. No, it says yeah. riches in glory, riches, you know, abounding, uh, marvelous, superfluous, uh, over, overflowing, unending. And where are those glory? Or where is that glory? I'm sorry. It's in Christ. That's right. So yeah. the more that we look at Jesus, the more that we put our eyes on him, the more that will be our hearts will be reminded whatever circumstance or situation we find ourselves in hey i'm ultimately going to be okay even if the situation isn't okay i'm ultimately going to be okay because my hope is not in the situation or the circumstances but it's in jesus that's right and and i don't want to i don't want to eliminate that paul is talking about practical realities here I mean, he sure. is he is saying that there are needs that will be our, our practical physical needs that God will, will meet. Um, but, but you raise such a great point there that what to Paul is ultimately satisfying is the glory of Jesus Christ, the glory of God that we see in the face of Jesus Christ as he describes it in Second Corinthians. And so that's again going to be the secret. You know, what's the secret to contentment? in abundance or in want, in plenty or in need. Well, 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 the secret is that we're not gauging our satisfaction based on our physical material possessions or comfort. Right. Our satisfaction is based exclusively on the glory of God that we see in Jesus Christ. And that is unchanging and right. unfading. Okay. And, and so it can be consistent and can lead us to have great contentment because it, it doesn't change even when our circumstances do. And so we have, we have hope. So God will provide our needs, but the biggest thing that we need is to have our souls satisfied through the glory of Jesus Christ. And that's what he's promised us in the gospel. Yeah. And that's why Paul can be so. And, and so then he just overflows in this prayer of thanksgiving. So to God, to our God and father, be glory forever and ever. Amen. Because that glory is going to be what satisfies us, what leads us to contentment, what leads us to trust and peace. And so, so Paul just overflows in praise because it's that glory that is going to meet all of his needs. So obviously, um, you know, we've covered a lot of scripture thus thus far over the last however many weeks we've been doing this uh, i have lost count of how many of these we've done yeah i don't i don't know uh and so what i'd love to do is you know given the fact that virtual grow group was something that that god put on your heart and I, i've just been so honored to be a part of it I, i've loved these conversations i've learned some things my heart has been encouraged um and so what i'd love to do is just give you the mic and let you kind of talk about these these final three verses and then just just conclude us and and kind of just share with us hey how do we respond to this and maybe a sneak peek uh, into what's to come yeah well and, and before i do that i, I want to thank you kyle as well for coming along on you know as you said earlier on this journey uh, it's been it's been fun not to be riding in the car alone on, <laughs> on all of these because um, yeah, I've just enjoyed this time and have been incredibly grateful for your generosity. I mean, you've, you've demonstrated the very kind of spirit that Paul is, is talking about here, just a generosity of time and energy to give to, to discipling our adults for these conversations. And so I've, I'm personally really grateful for your partnership in these over the last several weeks. And, and just as we, as we look at this, I just you know, want to briefly look at that last phrase, that last blessing that Paul gives. You know, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. And the thing about grace in, in the Bible is that it's not actually something that exists kind of sort of separate. Grace is a person. Mm -hmm. It's the grace that's in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as we think about all that Paul has, has told us and encouraged us and challenged us with, in this book of Philippians. Know that all of it comes through the grace that's found only in Jesus Christ himself. And so the, the prayer that Paul prays here 
is, is the prayer that I would want to pray for you today, that the grace of Jesus Christ and, and the abundance that we have in his, in his presence, that that would be with your spirit, that, that as you reflect on what you have learned and what the Lord has said to you through his word over these last several weeks as we've been going through Philippians, that you would just meet the presence of Jesus Christ himself. Mm. And that that would be an encounter with grace and that you would know the goodness of all of what God has done for us in Christ. Um, and then that just would give you joy and it would give you a joy that would overflow in wanting to, to serve and to give and to greet your brothers and sisters and to care for them, uh, to love a lost world and to be, to be bold in sharing the gospel, knowing that to live is Christ and to die is gain. Mm. Um, you know, that would be, that would be my hope. Uh, and if, you know, as, you, as you, we're wrapping up the study, if there's some of the weeks that you have missed, you know, all of these are available on the website. You can go back and, and check those out. But if you also would just be interested in looking at some summaries, I'm going to post in our Facebook Live chat and then also in the show notes on our website for this, uh, a couple of places where you can see just a summary of the teaching of the book of Philippians, one from John Piper in a, a really creative Bible study video series that he's done called Look at the Book. Those are great. Uh, so, yeah, they're, they're so great. And every yeah. week I kept wanting to recommend them. I was like, oh, well, I'll recommend them next week. And here it is. I'm finally just going to recommend. He has like, if you think we've talked a lot about the book of Philippians, you ought to My check goodness. out these, <laughs> these yes. videos. Yeah. Uh, they're, and, but they're great. So good. Uh, but I'll, I'll give one that kind of shows his summary of the book of Philippians and then also a link to the Bible Project's Read Scripture video that summarizes the message of Philippians and about six or seven minutes as well, which is, which is also wonderful. We just want to encourage you to carry this book with you. Um, you know, the reason we wanted to talk about this book over these weeks was because it speaks so much to the realities of, of where we are. And I would say, even though I feel like the realities of, of where things are today at the beginning of June, as we're taping this, compared to where we were when we started talking about the book of Philippians back in March, April, things are so, so different. Mm -hmm. And yet I feel like we need this book even more today than we needed back when we started. 100%. Yeah, you know, when we started, we were facing a global pandemic, and that's pretty daunting. And we still are, though they're hopeful signs, mm -hmm. but that's still with us. But now we also have an economic downturn that is unlike any that I have ever experienced in my lifetime. And now on top of that, and, and probably no doubt, and part of the stress that's caused by those two challenges, we, we now also have levels of racial and political unrest in our country, again, unlike any that have been in, in my lifetime. And these things are daunting. And, and I don't expect that I'm going to wake up tomorrow morning and any one of them, much less all of them, are just better or fixed or solved. I, these things will likely be with us for a period of time and weeks, and we're going to have to work through them. They're not just going to resolve themselves. They're going to require things of us. And so as followers of Jesus, we need the words that are spoken to us in Philippians. We need to know how do we live, not considering our own interests, but the interests of others. How do we consider others as more important than ourselves in the face of a health crisis, an economic crisis, a crisis of of community disunity. How do we do that? And so we need to keep coming back to the truths of God's word, not just for encouragement, not just for verses that we can put on coffee mugs or t-shirts. We need to come back to these words to show us how do I live with my brothers and sisters? Mm. And how do I live with my lost neighbors and coworkers and friends and family? How does this change my life? So that as Paul says in, in chapter one, so that now as always, Christ will be glorified in my body, mm. in the way that I live, in the way that I conduct myself as a citizen of heaven 
even in a broken world? How can Jesus be glorified in the way that I live? And we need that church. We need to come back to that. And so let's, let's not finish with Philippians. Let, let's keep letting God's word speak to us as we continue to reflect on the truths that we've learned over these, these last weeks. But let's also keep learning. And so as Paul, um, as, you know, Paul talked about here in Philippians, we have hope even in uncertain circumstances. That's not a theme that's unique to Paul. It's also a, a theme that Peter talked a great deal about in, in his first epistle as well. And so our grow groups starting this Sunday on June 7th, as they begin to meet in, our, in their Zoom gatherings each week, we're going to begin a new study in our grow groups. Over these last several weeks, our grow groups have primarily had conversation, caring for one another, reaching out to one another, just connecting. But we're going to bring Bible study back into those Zoom gatherings, and I'm excited about that. And we're going to begin a a six-week series talking about the theme of hope for a broken world in the, the little book of 1 Peter. So that's going to be great. Make plans now to be a part of your grow group. If you're not sure when your grow group is is meeting on Zoom, if you've kind of gotten disconnected, or if you want to get connected for the very first time, I'd encourage you to go to bearcreek.church slash grow groups, and you can find out all the current information about how you can get connected to a grow group online. Or for any of these things, just go to bearcreek.church slash adults. You'll find the links that you need to get to all of our, our resources. But I particularly encourage you to make plans now to be a part of one of those studies over Zoom as we're beginning First Peter. And, um, and Kyle just told me on Sunday that student ministry, I think, is as well going to be looking at First Peter in these weeks ahead. So a lot of our church, this is a place where we're going to be thinking together and learning and studying God's word together, which I'm, I'm excited about as, as something that we're going to be doing. I also want to let you know about something new that we are, we're starting, another video resource to encourage you in these upcoming weeks. I think one of the things that I have missed most over these last several months now of, you know, simulated church, <laughs> a simulated experience of having a sermon, simulated worship, it's real, but it's also not really real. And I, and I think we feel that and it's okay to feel that. But I think the thing that I have missed that we haven't figured out a way to simulate because you can't really simulate it even is just the sheer joy of bumping into someone in the hallways on our church campus on Sunday morning that I wasn't necessarily expecting to see and having a conversation that leaves me wonderfully encouraged and challenged by hearing what the Lord is doing in their heart and lives. And, and I've missed that. And so just for my own sake, (laughs) a little bit selfishly, but hopefully also for your benefit as well. I've spent some time over the last few days scheduling some interviews with church members that we're calling Bear Creek Conversations. And I basically just sit down with them and ask them, what have you been learning? What's the Lord been teaching you? What verse of scripture has encouraged you? What songs been on your heart? How have you been praying for our church, for our community? And hearing their answers already taped a lot of these that we're going to be sharing once a week on Tuesdays in a series called Bear Creek Conversations. And I hope that you will, you'll join in with those and be encouraged and challenged. Again, just by a short conversation with someone, hearing about what the Lord is doing in their lives. And, and let that be, again, it's, it's not a substitute. It's barely a simulation, but it's something of a taste of what it's like to just have the joy of bumping into a brother or sister on a Sunday morning at Bear Creek and hearing about what the Lord is doing in their lives and walking away encouraged and challenged. And and so I hope that you'll, you'll look for those. We'll have those on our adult resources page. We'll put those in our Facebook feed, our, our YouTube channel. We'll put them everywhere. You can normally find our, our video resources. I want you to start looking for those each Tuesday as we begin to roll those out. And, And I hope that those will be a source of encouragement and joy for you as well. Well, as we wrap up today, any other, any other last words you'd have for us, Kyle, before we sign off for today? <clears throat> no, I, I think you did a fantastic job, you know, bringing some conclusion to this. Um, yeah, I'll just, I'll just say, you know, I cannot wait for our church to begin regathering um, this weekend. I mean, just even seeing some people yesterday, um, 
albeit behind masks and people look way different behind masks. Multiple <laughs> people did not recognize me, uh, but it was so good. I mean, I, like you said, I know that, you know, we've tried to simulate things as much as we can, but there's really no simulation that even comes close to comparing to the fellowship of God's church, his people. And and so obviously, you know, people are going to come back as they feel comfortable. And that's awesome. We applaud that. Um, but I honestly just cannot wait to begin seeing some people um, because, man, 10 weeks of not seeing my family. Yeah, it's, it's rough. It's rough. And it, especially, you know, I'm thankful for Zoom. I'm thankful for technology. Um, but that human interaction, um, those elbow bumps and you know, virtual um, air high air hugs and air high fives. Um, they cannot come soon enough. So uh, if you're at church on Sunday or the next couple of Sundays, make sure you find me. I'll be around. Um, I cannot wait to, to see you and um, see how you're doing. I hope that you've been encouraged by our time in Philippians. And I know you're going to be encouraged by these Bear Creek conversations. Um, Scott's done a phenomenal job, not only with, with virtual grow group, but just being the brains behind you know, what's coming up next. And I know your heart will be encouraged. I'm going to definitely be tuning in as well. Yeah, great. Well, thank you, Kyle. And I think we, we've got some other things that are cooking. They're not quite finalized yet. So you may have some chances to see Kyle again on, on video again with us later this summer. But just wanted to uh, give you a, a taste of what's coming in the, in the week ahead. So you can keep connecting with us online, even as we prepare to regather starting this Sunday on June 7th. So if you need more information about that as well, it's on our church website, bearcreek.church slash regather. Feel free to go there and, and check out all of the latest, all the information that you would need to know if you do feel ready and you feel like it would be a safe and wise for you to, to begin regathering for worship this Sunday morning. You can go to that website and find that information. Save your seat to let us know you're coming so that we can be ready for you as well. And, and we will look forward to worshiping and learning and growing together with you, whether online or in person in, in the weeks and months ahead. We love you and we will see you soon.